snapper fishing. This, this seminar is really going to focus heavily on vermilion snapper and yellow, yellow eye snapper. Why? Because right now is the time to go out there and target these species. While you can catch snapper around the entire state of Florida, you know, what's happening down off the Keys, what's happening 100 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico, what's happening up off Destin really doesn't mean very much to you and I. What means a lot to us is what's happening right here. Does everybody fish right out front here, so to speak, Boca, Fort Lauderdale, Hillsborough? You know, this is our area. This is our neck of the woods. And I'm going to share some information with you about what works for us right here in the southeast here, okay? Before we get into the vermilions and the yellow eye snapper, I just want to touch real quick and provide a couple tips on some of the other snapper species, of course, that are available here. One of them being yellowtail snapper. Everybody familiar with the yellowtail snapper? Right, one of the most highly targeted, prized of all snapper. You catch them all, you know, throughout our region, off Miami, and of course, where's the yellowtail snapper capital of the world? The Keys, okay, and why is the Keys so much better than here? Reef, reef, coral reefs, you know, yellowtail snapper aggregate around coral reefs. They're attracted to coral reefs because coral reefs attract everything. It's a nursery, shrimp, crabs, bait fish. It's a supermarket, it's Publix, open to the public, so to speak. And where do all of those yellowtail snapper go? All around those reefs to feed like crazy. Unfortunately, off of our area, especially right out front here, we don't have such fertile reefs as they do down off, you know, the Keys. So we struggle to catch yellowtail. We can catch them. Sometimes you can go out there and really wreck them, but the conditions really have to be right. They really have to be right. And if you just randomly go out here to try and catch yellowtail snapper, you may find yourself in a position where there's no current at all. And if there's one thing that you need to catch yellowtail snapper, it's current. current. God, I love you guys, okay? It's current, you need moving water, okay? If you have no moving water, any chum, anything you put in the water is gonna go thoop, right to the bottom. And you're not gonna attract any of the yellowtail snappers, so you need current. So on that one occasion when you go out here, you better hope that the conditions are ideal for yellowtail snapper fishing. Also, when you're going to be targeting these yellowtail snapper, the proper rod and reel, okay, the proper rod and reel is not this, okay, this is not it. This cracks me up when I see people going out here snapper fishing with a ridiculously oversized reel, this awesome spinning rod. Okay, it's got a great tip, as you could see. The action's phenomenal. Plenty of line on here. The fish will never see that. Come on. If you're the guy that goes out there and leaves the dock with this type of tackle, you probably shouldn't even be at this seminar. Okay, honestly, you really need to step it up. Don't go out there with garbage gear because garbage gear leads to garbage catches. Okay, and you're not gonna catch anything. With the yellowtail snapper getting back to it, Really, all you need is this, a very light spinning rod. Seven foot, seven and a half foot, eight to 15 pound test. You can bump it up to 10 to 20 pound test at the very most. By the way, as you could all see, this is a chaos rod. And if you don't fish chaos rods, you'll never catch anything. Just want to throw that out there. So typical seven, seven and a half foot spinner, really light and comfortable. It's got a size three or 4,000 Daiwa BG spinning reel on here. Very simple, very affordable. It's loaded with 10 pound test braid. That's all you need. You want sensitivity and stealth when you're targeting these yellowtail snapper. You want to be able to feed a bait out in your chump slick and you want that bait to float out with the, at the same speed as the chunks and the chum that you're putting in the water. Okay, and this is the best way to do that. It's very sensitive and it's a lot of fun. It's very, very light. Could you fish with this all night long in your hand? She says she can, a big hand for her. Okay, it's very, very light. And that's super important because you wanna be comfortable when, you, when you're fishing. Additionally, it's strong enough in the event you go out here and catch a bigger fish or hook a bigger fish because when you're feeding baits back to yellowtail snapper, what may you hook? Mangrove. Mutton snapper, a larger mangrove snapper, or a prized cobia, okay? Especially at night, cobias will, you know, come right up in those chump slicks and in the chunk slicks. 
So you want to make sure that you've got plenty of line capacity, because keep in mind, you can hook a 30-pound Kobe on this rod and land it. You're not going to be undergunned. You've got a great drag system. You've got plenty of line capacity. Just take your time. Don't flip out. Some people go crazy, and they start swinging back. And before you know it, angler failure enters the equation, and you end up losing the fish because you did something wrong. Make sure that your connections are bulletproof, your knots, your leader material, your hooks. If it's a small circle hook or just a little jig head, that's an ideal size jig head to put a couple silver sides on, maybe a fresh strip of ballyhoo or a bonita, or of course a strip of squid, a, a small live pilchard. You know, a yellowtail is a snapper, they're aggressive. And as long as they're in feeding mode, they will eat but that's the ideal rod for yellowtail snapper fishing in our, our area. The problem that we face right here is the pressure. There are so many, but you ever go out here on a flat calm Sunday morning? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, or night. This Saturday, as a matter of fact, if you get a chance, I want everybody to go fishing on their boats this Saturday, okay? Because it's going to be flat calm. Last, sat, last weekend was rough. This weekend's going to be flat calm, glass calm. You go out there on a Saturday morning, and at around 10.30, in about 150 feet of water, I want you to stop and count the boats as far as you can see north and south, and you can stop counting at 500. Okay? And it's not only guys like you and I that are out there targeting a variety of different species. What else are we dealing with? Divers and snorkelers. What do you think a yellowtail snapper does when he sees 10 guys jump in the water with air bubbles coming off of them? You think that fish is going to feed? You think that fish is going to respond to your chunk slick or chump slick? No way. He's gone. And he may not be gone, but he's got lockjaw. Okay, literally, he's, he's completely stunned. So really, the best snapper fishing for yellowtail and mutton, if you're specifically targeting those species, out here is certainly going to be at night when there's less pressure. Okay, it's certainly going to be at night. Not that you can't catch them during the day. You can. There's a couple of party boats go, that go out here. They drift. They come back to have a decent catch, to have a pile of fish on the dock, but you didn't realize there were 30 guys on the boat. Okay, and when you start to do the math, you realize maybe it wasn't that good. Okay, so for recreational guys, try and go out here at night. On the mutton snapper side, you know, one trick for catching mutton snapper off of our coast here are really long leaders, long leaders. You know, from that sinker to the hook, that leader should be at least 20 feet. Okay, a mutton snapper will swim out in the open sand. Unlike a yellowtail that really relates to structure, mutton will relate to structure, but they'll also swim out in open sandy bottom. And you want a nice long leader because they're also very, very finicky. Why do you want that long leader? Because you don't want that mutton snapper to see or hear that lead, that sinker. If he hears that lead bouncing on any rock like this, okay, hopefully you can hear that in the mic, he's gone. He's gone, especially the bigger ones. Forget the little ones. The little ones are aggressive. They're babies. They don't know any better. Okay? They're like little kids. They don't know any better, and they'll attack and try and eat whatever they can. But who wants to go out here and catch a 12-inch mutton snapper that you can't even keep? We all want to go out and catch the larger mutton snapper, of which there are not many off of our coast. And to be able to catch a mutton snapper over 10 pounds right out front here is a rarity. I can tell you in 24 years of fishing out here, I've caught one mutton snapper over 10 pounds. Okay, one. Not that I've targeted them a lot, and you'll catch a lot of the five to eight pounders, but only one over 10. Actually, it was really big. But nevertheless, it's not a common fish in our area. So when you are going to target them, you've got to be stealthy about it. You've got to think about the pressure that these fish are experiencing, the yellowtails and the mutton snapper. You've got to understand what's happening during the day, that they're completely being spooked by so many different boats, so many different divers, okay? And there's only so much structure right here. So you have to understand the fish's behavior. But again, that's not the topic of tonight's seminar. Tonight's seminar, we're going to talk about, like I said earlier, we're going to focus on vermilion snapper and yellow eye snapper. Those are two species that are extremely popular. They're absolutely delicious on the dinner table. Anyone can fish for them. 
and you can really put a great catch together, and this is the time of the year to do it. These fish are about to start spawning in the spring. They spawn from the spring to the fall. Right now, they're eating like crazy. They're fattening up. Okay, they're getting ready for that. So now is the time to go out and target these fish. The nice thing about vermilion snapper, everybody familiar with a vermilion snapper for the most part? Okay, we're talking about a snapper that is not giant. Okay, this is a one to three pound fish. And I thought about that. I said, how do you make a seminar exciting when you're targeting a fish that's this big? Okay, one to three pounds. But it's exciting. I find it to be very exciting going out there and going vermilion fishing. A lot of people don't. Why? Because they're fishing tackle that's way too heavy. Okay, they don't even know when they're getting a vermilion snapper bite. They're fishing 30 pound gear, 40 pound gear, 50 pound gear, saying, oh, I'm going to drop down and maybe I'll catch a grouper and maybe I'll catch a vermilion snapper. No, 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 no. Are you grouper fishing or are you vermilion fishing? What are you doing? Okay, make up your mind because that's two different venues and two different scenarios all together. I find vermilion snapper to be very, very challenging. Once you find them and you get on top of them, you often can catch quite a few, okay, and limit out. Anybody know the limit for vermilion snapper? What is the Florida regulations? Five. And what is the minimum size? Twelve inches. And by the way, if you don't have a ruler on the boat, grab the snapper, hold it on the top of a five-gallon bucket. If he makes it to both sides, he's twelve inches, okay, and you can pinch the tail. So keep that in mind. Most five gallon buckets, if not all, are exactly 12 inches. So five, you are allowed to keep five, and they do not count in your 10 snapper aggregate. So you can catch 10 other snapper, muttons, mangroves, yellow eyes, and have five additional vermilion snapper. So they don't count in that 10 fish aggregate. Yellow eye snapper, minimum size? That is a tough one. What? 12 inches. Exactly. And how many yellow eye snapper can you keep? 10. Ten. I like you. Okay. So you are 100% right. So again, you can go out there and keep 10 yellow eye snapper per angler and 5 vermilion snapper per angler, all at least 12 inches. The vermilions, as I mentioned earlier, to me, I find it to be very challenging to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go out tomorrow and specifically target vermilion snapper. That's my goal, is I'm gonna go out and I just wanna go vermilion snapper fishing. I really enjoy it. I like the challenge of finding them. I like eating them and baking them or frying them whole. Again, it's just one of the best fish out there. Is it one of the hardest fighting fish out there? No, it's two pounds, okay? Often the lead weighs more than the fish. So don't think you're going out there and you need fighting belts and all of that kind of stuff. You don't. That's not what this is about. Okay? However, it, it is all about using the right tackle. It's all about using the right tackle. That's going to make a huge difference. And again, it's not this. Okay, by the way, this is what we're raffling off. Okay? Yeah. I'm not kidding. I'm not getting that away. I love that thing. I use that all the time. Marshall doesn't know it, but I use that all the time. So again, it's all about tackle. But before we talk about tackle, let's talk about how to find vermilion snapper. Vermilion snapper are a structure-oriented species. There has to be structure. Okay? There has to be primarily either wrecks, deep water rock piles, or ledges, but they love those wrecks. Okay, you're flagged. Okay, they love those wrecks. Out front, right outside Hillsborough Inlet, we have a whole series of wrecks, a whole series of them. But there's only a handful that are deeper than 200 feet. That's where you want to be if you're looking for these vermilion snapper is in at least 200 feet of water. The primary depth for vermilion snapper is 200 to 500 feet of water. All around structure, primarily deep water wrecks. We only have a few here. However, Run south. The further south you go, the more wrecks there are, the more structure there is, okay? And I highly recommend get away from right out front here because there's so many guys who are fishing these small number of wrecks just southeast of the inlet. You guys know all the wrecks that I'm talking about? If you don't, just go to the reef locator on our website. They're right there. They're public knowledge. Okay, there's maybe half a dozen spots. They can be productive, but what I have found is they hold a lot of small vermilion snapper. 
the little eight inch, 10 inch fish. You could sit there all day long and catch them, but they're just pecking away at your baits. And again, you've got to weed through 10 in order to get one keeper. I don't like to do that. Okay, I prefer to target the larger fish that are in the 12 to 16, 18 inch range, and you're going to find those further south. Off Fort Lauderdale, there's some great spots, okay, and even off Miami, the spots get even better. So if your boat is trailerable and you're serious about finding these vermilions, you may want to truck it down to Miami and fish off that coast or, of, cor of course, run down there. So how do you find these spots? Well, of course, a lot of them are public knowledge. They're on charts. However, one of the tools that we've been using recently is something called Seymour. Okay. And let me just kind of show you exactly what this is. I know way in the back there, it's going to be kind of hard to see, okay? but this is a portable screen and it's obviously portable because it would be pretty hard for me to bring my 39 foot CB and put it right here. Okay. And it has a chip which shows you the bottom in a type of three dimensional format that is absolutely astonishing. You can see every little nook and cranny. Okay, and I'll kind of zoom in. You can even see that a little bit better. Every single little rock and nook and cranny. Now, here's the cool stuff. Here's the cool thing about Seymour. This has a built-in GPS, this little unit. So I could sit on my couch, kick my feet up, sip a rum and Coke, and find the spots that I'm going to fish on Saturday and mark them right on the screen, okay, and scroll through and say, hey, here's a new spot. I want to fish this one. I simply get on my boat. This has a little cigarette lighter kind of plug. I plug it in and boom. This is a chart plotter. It's not a fish finder. There's no transducer. I can't see the bottom, but I don't need to see the bottom. All I need to see is that, okay, right there. So this is an absolutely vital tool. And understand, see more chap, see more mapping, their charts. These guys don't advertise with me on TV. They don't advertise with me in my magazine. Not yet. I'm hoping after tonight they will. But <laughs> This isn't an endorsement for them. This is real world stuff. I'm being straight with you guys, okay? And a lot of, guy, a lot of people are probably gonna say to me, Mike, you're nuts for sharing that information. Well, isn't that why we're here? To learn how to fish and learn how to put more fish in the boat? Okay, you all went out of your way to come here. I'm gonna do the best that I can to hook you up. And I'm telling you, this is a vital piece of equipment that it is compatible with Simrad, Garmin, Lowrance, a lot of different screens. You buy the chip for your region, you pop it in, and it is a game changer, a game changer. Why? Because there's something called phantom wrecks. Okay, a phantom wreck is on a chart, or someone gave you some GPS numbers, and you pop them in your machine, and you think there's a wreck there, and you go there, and you're looking on your sounder when, you know, for the wreck, and guess what's there? Nothing, zero, zilch, barren land. There may have been some sort of structure there in the past, but maybe hurricanes or storms, who knows, a lot of different scenarios, or they may have never been a piece of structure there. It could have completely deteriorated, a lot of different scenarios. So those are called phantom wrecks or a ghost wreck. Keep in mind, fuel nowadays, $4.89 or some ridiculous thing at the fuel you know, dock. And for a boat like mine running triple 350 Verados at 50 miles an hour, I don't want to be chasing around ghost wrecks and phantom wrecks. I want to know exactly where I'm going. That's why this is so important, because you can see exactly where you're going. This doesn't lie. I'm telling you, it doesn't lie. So make sure that you check out Seymour at the end of the seminar if you want to come up here and look at it a little bit more. They don't cover the entire area. You can see just what's kind of lit up but they cover everything along the coast, some really deep stuff out on the deep drop grounds, out on the swordfish grounds, but certainly worth every penny. No doubt about it, it will increase your game. So the chip itself for each particular region, I'm gonna, I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe the chips are somewhere around 150 to $200. However, you could buy the unit that I just showed you with the screen, with everything, I think is $7.99. Okay, so this way, if it's not compatible with your boat, uh, you can just buy that portable unit and you could take it with you. I could come fish with you and plug it into your boat. Okay, so it's really a cool feature. And I'm going to, you know, try and address all of the questions at the end, but you had a quick question? Okay. 
Got it. So he pointed out that the chip is more than 150 to 200, but I got to be honest with you. I don't care how much it is. I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's the cost of one reel, you know. Then buy that. 799, still worth it. I'm telling you, it's a game changer. I can't stress it enough, okay? So in turn, now you've got some spots. Now you're using your chart plotter, you're using your Seymour, whatever it is, and you found some spots that you want to fish either out here or further south. Next is getting to that particular area. And before you even wet a line, remember that you are fishing for vermilion snapper in 200 to 500 feet of water. You are not anchoring. This is not the type of species where you need to anchor your boat and put a chump slick in the water. That is not what you're doing when you're targeting vermilion snapper. You want to drift. This is a structure-oriented species. They associate to the structure, but unlike a big grouper that sits in a little hole, or in a little cave or under a ledge waiting for something to come by, the vermilions are schooling fish that will swim around the structure, over the top of the structure. You know, they're looking for food, they're aggressive. So you want to drift. But first, you've got to determine your, your speed and your direction of drift. How do you do that? You get right to the spot, you stop your boat right on top of the wreck, right on top of it. Okay, make sure that you see that structure right on your sonar, right on your fish finder. Stop right on top of it. Don't put a line in the water. Give it five minutes while you're rigging up, while you're cutting bait, while you're drinking a beer. I don't care what you're doing. Okay, give it a few minutes. Let the boat settle down and let the current take over in the wind. And on your chart plotter, you've got a little track, right? A little red or black track showing you exactly where the boat has traveled. Everybody have that on their boat? Okay, if you don't, you should upgrade your electronics <laughs> because you're missing the boat. <laughs> it's 2019, all right? I mean, you need that track. So in turn, you then just simply look at your track and you decide, hey, I need to backtrack and, you know, set my boat up in this one particular position well ahead of the wreck. So this way we drift right alongside it, right over it. Don't be afraid to drift right over it. Keep in mind, every now and then you're going to get hung up, but that's okay because when you're structure fishing, if you never get hung up, you're never fishing close enough to the structure. Okay, so pr be prepared to lose some terminal tackle. And keep in mind, there are many, many days when these vermilion snapper will be on the upcurrent side of the wreck. There are other days they'll be directly on top of the wreck. There's other days they'll be on the back side of the wreck waiting for that current to sweep crustaceans and bait fish over and around that wreck right to them. So you've got to fish all around it. Don't get to the spot. Stop your boat. Drop a bait down. Go three minutes. Oh, man, I'm not getting a bite. Forget it. There's nothing here. Let's go. I love people like that because I'll sit right on the side watching you, just waiting for you to leave. Okay? It doesn't work like that. Wrecks are big. These fish are on the move. They're moving around. They're swimming. Invest some time. Give it 15, 20 minutes at least. Do two or three drifts. Okay? And if you catch one, when you catch one, not if, when, okay, pay attention. Where was I in relation to the structure? You know, you may think that just because this is a little small one, two, three pound snapper that it's stupid, but it's not. It's a smart fish, okay, it really is. It's a smart fish. It's a very slow growing fish. A three pound vermilion snapper. Somebody want to guess how old that fish is? At least 10 years old, 10 to 15 years old for a three pound vermilion snapper, okay? It's learned a lot in that amount of time. It's learned a lot, okay? And again, they just don't get that big. They grow very, very slow. Within one year, you know, I don't know how big they are. They're certainly still juveniles. You know, it takes them a number of years just to get the spawning size. But certainly a three pound fish is at least 10 years old. So remember that they're schooling, they'll relate to a certain piece of the structure. I've had scenarios where I fished a wreck and all the vermilions were balled up on one little corner. One little corner, that southeast corner of the wreck. Okay, and nowhere else. You can drift all around it, you can't get a bite. You set your drift up to go right over that southeast corner every single time you get bites. Okay, but they're not anywhere else around the wreck. What do they look like on your sonar? Look for little suspended marks. Vermilion Snapper 2, 
unlike mutton snapper, okay, mutton snapper will rarely come way up off the bottom. Vermilion snapper, if you're fishing 300 feet of water, you'll mark them 50 feet off the bottom, okay, 50 feet off the bottom. So, you know, remember to really keep an eye on your chart plotter, to really keep an eye on your sonar. There's a position on my boat, on my 39 CB, where I fish. I fish right here, my screens are right here. And everybody knows it. Whenever they're on my boat, they know not to stand right there. They know it because they know I'm going to kick them off that spot. Okay, Because I'm constantly, constantly looking at the screens, evaluating where am I, what direction is the boat moving in, how fast is the boat moving, do I need to adjust my drift. I'm constantly looking at the path of travel. Okay, Every time I catch one or we hook up on the boat, I'm not marking you know, spot, spot, spot. I don't need to do that because they swim. And where they are today may not be where they are tomorrow. And I could tell you that from personal experience. You know, when we film our television series, a lot of people say, man, you go out there and I don't know how you do it. You catch all of those fish so fast. You're like a god. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It took us two days. Okay? There's plenty of times when we'll go out there to film a show and we will fish for more than one day. I'm being straight with you. And oftentimes, one of the two days is going to be the better day. Okay, where today we may not have caught anything. We'll go tomorrow to those same spots, but the conditions are just a little bit different. The current's a little bit different. The wind is a little bit different. The, the, is it overcast? Is it sunny? The water temperature? There's all these different variables that change. That's the really cool thing about fishing, is that it's a constantly changing environment. It's not like a, any sort of field that's always static, that's always exactly the same. Our world is never the same. It's always changing, hour to hour, am I right, with the tide. Also keep this in mind, a lot of people don't realize this, but tide, incoming or outgoing, also has an effect on bottom fishing. You know, people often relate tide to snook fishing at an inlet or something like that. Is it incoming tide or, or maybe I'm high speed trolling for Wahoo and I want to fish what kind of tide? That's right, outgoing tide. You guys listened last month, okay? With the snapper fishing, with the vermilions, it's the same thing. Sometimes they'll feed better on one tide, either an incoming tide or on an outgoing tide. Remember, these are fish. They're like people. They don't eat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They just don't do that. There's only one fish I know of that does that, and that's a bluefish. Bluefish will eat until they're full and then they'll regurgitate and then they'll eat until they're full and then they'll throw up and then they'll eat until they're full and they'll just keep doing this until there's no more food and they'll never stop eating, okay? Vermilion snapper or any snapper species are not like that. So you've got to put in the time and if at first you don't succeed, don't think that that wasn't a good spot because it certainly may have been. They just must have been turned off or maybe not turned on at that particular time. So we know again that we're drifting over these structures. We've determined our drift pattern. We're drifting around the wreck, over the wreck, on the downside of the wreck, on the upside of the wreck. And it's the same if there's rock piles or ledges. You know, with that Seymour system, you'll see off Fort Lauderdale, there's an area, it's about the size of, oh gosh, I would say three or four square football fields, like the size of three or four football fields loaded in rock piles. Just rock pile, rock pile, rock pile, rock pile, rock pile. Great, great spot to fish for the vermilions. It's in about 320 to 370 feet of water. 320 on the inside, 370 on the outside, goes up for about 300 yards, okay? It's a great place, but even there, sometimes they'll only bite in a certain depth, where if you're drifting across it, you may only get bites from 330 to 340, and then you're not getting bites anymore. Everything's exactly the same, but the water's just a little bit deeper or a little bit shallower on the inside. These little nuances make a difference. These are not dumb fish, and you've got to pay attention. You know, it's all in the details. So now that we know where we're fishing and exactly how we're drifting, it's time to drop some baits down. We're not chumming or chunking. That's not what we're doing when we're fishing for vermilion snapper. Why? Anybody? Because we're making really short drifts, right? The current out here is often very strong. It's rare 
When you're out here in 300 to 500 feet of water, it is very, very rare that we're dealing with less than a knot and a half or two knots of current. Sometimes the current's so strong, you know, forget it. This time of the year we get these southeast breezes that come up. You get a current that's racing up the beach and a southeast breeze pushing you even further up. You may be drifting at three knots out in three and a half, I mean out in 350 feet of water. So you're moving very, very fast. There really is no reason to chump. Plus, again, we're trying to cover ground. Okay, we're trying to cover ground for these vermilions. So we're not chumming or chunking. We're dropping down fresh bait. The freshest bait that you can get your hands on, the better. This is just like with every other type of fishery. Ballyhoo, blue runners, goggle eyes. I'm not talking about live. I'm talking about fresh dead bait that you can cut nice strips from. Bonitas. And of course, what's the staple? Squid. Frozen squid. Okay, frozen squid. Thank God for frozen squid. Okay, because everything eats squid. But keep in mind, not all frozen squid is created equal. When you go to your local tackle shop, may it be right here. Marshall, do you guys sell frozen squid? Okay, thank you, Scott. You know, open the box. Don't be afraid. Open that box of frozen squid and look at it. If it's all discolored and mushy and nasty looking, if you wouldn't eat it, don't buy it. Okay, if you wouldn't eat it, don't buy it. And I'm not suggesting you eat it. I'm just saying, if you wouldn't eat it, don't buy it. Look at it, study it, is it clean and nice? Does it look like somebody actually paid attention when they packaged it, you know, when they processed it? It makes a big difference. It's like, I can't stress enough how important these small details are. I'm not touching that stinky stuff, don't give that to me, okay? <laughs> but you could open, okay, hey, you know what? I'm gonna touch that stinky stuff. That's right, okay. Perfect example. I came into chaos. I want to buy some squid. I open this up. Am I going to buy this box of squid? You're damn right I am. You're damn right. This beautiful squid. Put that right up. Put it in my bag. I'll take two boxes for the weekend. Okay, that's absolutely beautiful. It's clean. Okay, it's not bloody or juicy. It looks like it was packaged with care. So that is great bait to use if you cannot get your hands on fresh bait. If you can get your hands on some fresh bait also, all the better. You know, it's always nice to have a variety of bait. Also keep in mind though, the nice thing with squid, what's another advantage to squid? Everything eats squid. Everything. First of all, it's affordable because you get a five pound box at, I don't know, $16.99? Anybody? Whatever the price is. 25. 25 bucks. Well, for that squid, it's worth 25 bucks, all right? That's really nice squid. So, as a matter of fact, that's a steal at 25 bucks, okay, seriously. So, in turn, it's frozen. You can reuse it, you know, in the future. Don't thaw it and refreeze it. If you do have two boxes on the boat, make sure you keep one box frozen, okay? You don't want it to thaw out, okay, and then refreeze it. So, keep one box frozen. But an advantage to that squid is everything eats it. So when you are targeting vermilion snapper, do not be surprised if you catch African pompano, if you catch a variety of other types of snapper species, cobia, anything, groupers, okay, everything eats it. Remember though that vermilion snapper have a very small mouth, and we're gonna get into the tackle in a minute here, but they have a small mouth. This is not like a red grouper that goes Woof! and inhales, you know, whatever it could fit into its enormous gullet. That's not what we're talking about, a little fish with a little mouth like this. So are you going to fish a whole squid? No, okay, they're going to peck it away and you're never going to catch anything. So you've got to prepare that squid properly. Let the squid thaw, cut the head off, which is a great piece of bait in itself. If it's really large, cut that in half. We like to call that an octopus bait because it looks like an octopus flowing through the water. You know, some of the other species that you catch along with the vermilions, love that. The porgies especially love that head part. And then the body, slice it open, clean out the inside, get all the guts out. There's a little spine in there that you would swear is made out of plastic. It feels, right? You guys are familiar with what I'm talking about? You know, it literally you're like, oh my God, the squid ate a piece of plastic. No, that's its internal skeletal thing. Okay, so get all of that out of there and just cut nice, narrow strips. 
okay? Nice narrow strips. In some areas, I know like up off Destin and stuff, they fish with a little ball of squid because again, the vermilion comes up, it goes doop, eats this little ball of bait and it's easy peasy. When you're fishing with a long strip, sometimes they grab the end of it and you know what happens? You get the guys that are fishing this kind of tackle and they get those bites and they're, oh, I got, oh, damn, I missed them. Oh, I got them. Oh, man, I missed them. Oh, I got them. No, oh, man, I missed them. I, I got them. No, I missed them. Well, you missed them because he's just got that strip and he's tugging on it and they're thinking that they're hooking up. You know, they don't understand what's really happening. So you have to stop for a second and again, think about that fish. Don't be that guy. You know, think about that fish, grabbing that bait, give him a chance to eat it, give him a chance to get it down its throat, okay? So don't fish with a piece of bait that's extraordinarily large. You don't need it for the vermilion snapper. Now, if there are some yellowtail snappers around, that's a different story, and we're gonna talk more about that in a second. Now, most importantly, when it comes to yellowtail, I'm sorry, to vermilion snapper fishing is the tackle that you're fishing. This is what's going to make all of the difference in the world is the tackle. As I mentioned earlier, most guys go out there targeting these vermilion snapper with tackle that is just ridiculously heavy. They're fishing, I've seen guys with the Lingren Pittman deep drop reel, okay, <laughs> 300 feet of water with a short stout rod with this big deep drop rig like they're fishing for, I have no idea what, snowy groupers or something, okay? And they're deep dropping in 300 feet of water with this equipment. And I question, I go, what are you doing? Okay, how do you expect to even see any bites to see what's happening? It's way too heavy. You gotta bring it down, bring it all the way down. Plus remember, how many vermilion snapper can you keep? Five. I don't wanna go out there and drop down a five hook rig, get on top of them, Catch five, push a button, reel up a stringer of vermilion snapper, go one, two, three, four, five, okay, we're going home. Okay, trip's over, one drop. No, I'm going out there for the sport, for the fun, for the challenge. I'm perfectly happy catching fish one at a time. Okay, if I catch two, I'm even happier. But I certainly am not targeting these fish with your typical five hook deep drop rig. That is not what we use when we are targeting vermilion snapper. We use what is called a high-low rig. Some people may call it a chicken rig. It is nothing more than a very simple two-hook rig. You can see, let me just wind this up a little bit, make it a little bit easier. Again, absolutely beautiful and effective, deadly effective chaos rod. So you can see that high hook up there, and there's the low hook right there, three to four feet. Now where my hand is is a little loop where I'm gonna put my sinker, my bank sinker. There's no rig that could be easier to create or tie than the high-low rig. This is an absolute staple in Florida fishing. It's a staple really all over the country for a variety of different fisheries. But down here when you are targeting vermilion snapper, I'm telling you straight up, if you have a rig that works better for vermilion snapper than this rig, tell me about it because I've never found one yet. Okay. I tie this on 60 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon leader material. Why 60 pound if I'm targeting a fish that weighs one to three pounds? Why would I fish 60 pound? A, structure is certainly important, but not that important. In other words, when I hook a vermilion snapper, he's not taking me back into the wreck. Okay, he's not pulling me back into the wreck. It's because I'm telling you that if you fish for vermilion snapper enough times, you're gonna hook a variety of other species. You're gonna get bycatch, you're gonna catch the cobias, you're gonna catch the groupers, African pompano, everything eats squid. Okay, you're gonna catch a variety of different species and I wanna make sure that my leader can withstand some of those larger fish because like I've said in all of my seminars, one fish can make the whole trip. Right? So yeah, even though I'm going out there vermilion snapper fishing, I hook a 30 pound cobia. Ooh, baby, I want that 30 pound cobia in the boat because that just made my whole trip right there. So I wanna make sure that I'm ready to handle a larger fish, but it's a balance. You don't wanna go crazy. I don't need to fish 100 pound leader. Okay, so 50, 60 pound is absolutely plenty. Remember too, these fish are not incredibly line shy. This is not a tuna. 
Okay, that's not what this is. This is a vermilion snapper, dark water, and it's aggressive. You know why it's aggressive? Because it's a schooling fish. If it sees a bait, if it doesn't eat it, what's going to happen? It's buddy will. So it, they're instinctively, they're aggressive. Okay, so they don't have time to go, oh, wait, is that, is that 60 pound or is that 40 pound? Wait, what is that right there? They don't have that time. They see that bait, they go after it. Very little terminal tackle, very little junk, as I like to call it. This is about as stealthy as it can be. There's no swivels other than at the end of my line, and we'll talk about the line in a second, there's a simple snap swivel, there's a small loop tied on the top of the leader material, this is a dropper loop that's right on the line right there. The branch is anywhere from six to eight inches long. There's a 2-0 VMC sure set circle hook. By the way, just like with Chaos Rods, if you don't fish VMC hooks, no fish will ever bite your bait, okay? 2-0, that's all you need. These fish have small mouths, a very, very small mouth. Half the time, just like I showed you before, you're gonna get bites and be swinging and missing them, go, oh, I missed them, I missed them. Well, that's because your hook's a 6-0, okay, or an 8-0. You're fishing a hook that's way too big for a vermilion snapper. 2-0 is ideal. You can even fish a 1-0 hook because today's hooks are smaller and stronger than yesteryear's hooks. Back in the day, we had to fish really heavy duty stuff. Not anymore. Now they're using, you know, BMC is using a vanadium steel and a coastal black coating, which makes the hook stronger and sharper and, and smaller, you know, again. So it's all about stealth and it's about strength, and it's about getting that hook in the fish's mouth. A circle hook is all that you need. Let the fish hook itself. Let the fish hook itself. You know, when circle hooks first came out, and I don't want to say when they first came out, because they've been out for a very long time. When they started to gain popularity with the recreational angling community, we all got our hands on these hooks, and they were no longer shaped like a J. Suddenly it was shaped like a J, and then it came back in the point, and we're like, what the heck is that? What? I'm not using that thing. Okay, how's that in the world? Is that ever supposed to hook a fish? It's rare we don't use circle hooks now. They're deadly effective. They're, it's a super design and it works amazingly well. But understand that not all circle hooks are created equal. Remember I mentioned to you that I fish the BMC SureSet circle hooks because it's a thin wire circle hook. They also make you know, a variety of other circle hooks, but they're much heavier gauge. I don't need a heavy gauge hook in this scenario. I'm not targeting 50 to 100 pound yellowfin tuna. I'm targeting one to four pound snapper. So a very thin hook is gonna penetrate the corner of that fish's mouth very easily. It's gonna allow my bait to have as natural of a presentation as possible. And it really is just gonna provide the all around best experience. And then again, a few feet down, three or four feet down, is another hook, and then my loop for the sinker. I fish a bank sinker, not a pyramid sinker, a bank sinker. Why? Because if you fish a pyramid sinker, it's more likely to get hung up in the reef or in the wreck. You want that round type of bank sinker. Large loop, so it's easy to switch the lead because you want to vary or adjust the amount of lead that you're fishing based on the depth and the conditions. If I can get away with an eight to 10 ounce sinker, am I gonna fish a 16 to 20 ounce lead? You might, I'm not going to. Okay, why? Because it's A, it's a lot more work to reel it back up to the boat. B, I'm losing a level of sensitivity and a level of stealth. Okay, so I try and minimize my lead to make sure that that sinker and that rig are on the bottom, but I don't need any more than that. Okay, just make sure that you fish enough lead to fish on the bottom. So in this particular case, I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple different outfits that we fish. You can see here, this is a seven foot rod. Okay, it's rated for 12 to 20 pound line. It's got a really soft tip just like that, really soft, so I can detect even the smallest bite. It's super comfortable, super dirty too. Look at all that vermilion snapper gack on there. That's, I'm not kidding you, that's all vermilion snapper scales all over that, because that's the last time I use this rod. Okay, all over, man, I really need to wash my rods better. Anyhow, okay, very small, very soft tip, so I can detect those bites, but it also has plenty of backbone. In the event I hook a larger fish, okay, it's got plenty of backbone. Little Daiwa Saltiga Star Drag Reel, 
loaded with 20 pound braid. Okay, very, very sensitive, plenty of line capacity, but also really strong in the event that I hook a larger fish or two fish at one time. But what's important about this, more so than anything else, is really that sensitivity and the comfort level. This is the rod that I'm gonna fish in anywhere to 300 feet of water, 200, 250, 300, as long as there's not a lot of current and I can get away with it, it's a super, super comfortable rod. Ma'am, could you fish with that all day under your arm? Okay, is that light and comfortable? Okay, so again, that's gonna make a very big difference is the comfort level. Our line, as I mentioned, is 20 pound braid and it goes directly to a snap swivel. There's times where we will add a short piece of monofilament as a top shot, like on here. Okay, which I don't know if you can see from back there, but the reel is loaded with braid and there's about 20 or 25 feet of 40 pound test on top of the braid to act as a shock absorber because braid has no stretch whatsoever. So we often will add a piece of monofilament, a top shot between the braid that's on the reel and the rig itself. However, the truth is in this particular scenario, you don't have to do that. Okay, you don't have to do that. You certainly can tie your braid right to the swivel and that'll be a perfect outfit for this particular scenario. Now, lately, Chaos was kind enough to build me something a little bit heavier and a little bit longer. So this is an eight and a half foot rod, okay? It's graphite, so it's incredibly light, it's incredibly sensitive, it's a composite rod actually. And I use this in deeper water from 300 to 500 feet. I don't use deep drop reels in that scenario if I don't have to. And the difference is gonna be the current and the speed. Okay, if I can fish manually, I prefer to fish manually. It's sportier, I enjoy the fight. And by this being eight and a half foot, this tip is incredibly sensitive. And that's what I want. I want that sensitive tip. Don't ever put your hook on the guides. Okay, and you can see, again, really soft, but plenty of backbone. And it's really fun to fight even these small one to three pound vermilion snappers are very sporty on this particular outfit. It really brings the game up a whole other level instead of overkill. This is the same reel, but a size 35. That was a size 20. It's a 35 HA loaded with 30 pound braid. Plenty of line capacity, five, 600 yards of line on here. And in this particular scenario, I've got my braid tied right to the snap swivel, like I said to you a minute ago. You don't need that top shot for this particular scenario because those vermilions are not really gonna pull back all that hard, okay? So again, these are really my go-to manual outfits when targeting these vermilions. However, if I wanna fish deeper or if there's a lot of current and I need to fish a lot of lead, again, I step it up yet again. Eight foot rod rated for 20 to 40 pound line, but what you may or may not realize is that's a power assist reel. That's not a manual reel. Uh, this is the newest generation of power assist reels from Daiwa. This is the Panacom 500. So what they've done with this reel is made some huge improvements. First of all, they've increased the gear ratio. So it's faster than it's ever been before. Not only with the power mode, but also manually. In the past, Daiwa, their Tanacom reels, their power assist reels, and when I say power assist, there's a little outlet right here. There's a cord that plugs into this and you plug it into your boat or you connect it with alligator clips to an external battery, but power is provided to this reel. Okay, I can still turn the handle manually. In the past, that gear ratio was like one to one. Okay, it was so slow that if you wanted to crank a fish up manually from 400, 500 feet, it would take you 400 or 500 minutes, okay, to crank that up. They beefed it up to, I think this is now 3.7 to one. So they've almost quadrupled the retrieve ratio, which is a huge benefit. Number two, very much like a bait caster, look at my thumb. I've just released that bell with my thumb. So like a bait caster, you don't have the lever over here. It's right there, the release, click, okay? 
So now this is designed, this is a power assist electric reel, but it is not designed to fish out of a rod holder like the heavy duty electric deep drop gear that you may be accustomed to or that we use for really deep water stuff. This makes deep drop fishing really, really sporty and really fun. And you can hold it right in your left hand if you're a righty. You can release it, like I said, with your thumb that opens up the bail. And then the little lever for the speed is right there as well. So you can control the speed with your left hand and you have a little intermittent button. So if you get a bite or you just want to reel up a little bit of slack with your thumb, you can just push one button and it'll retrieve some of that line. So this is loaded with 20 pounds. Now you may be saying, wait a minute, why is your manual gear loaded with 30 pound braid, but your electric gear is loaded with 20 pound braid? Anybody have an idea? Okay, that's right, because I'm fishing deeper with this, and especially if I'm targeting the yellow eye snapper, which are gonna be deeper. The vermilions are gonna be anywhere from 200 to 500. The yellow eyes are gonna be anywhere from 300 to 700, 750. So I'm gonna be fishing deeper, and I want to be able to fish the least amount of lead and by sizing down, by going to a lighter class line, there's less restriction in the water, less drag on that line, and I'm able to fish with potentially 24 ounces instead of 32 ounces, or 20 ounces instead of 32 ounces. That line is going to make a very, very big difference. Does that make sense to everybody? So in the past, we used to have this mindset where if you're fishing deeper water, you need a lot more lead, you need heavier equipment, you need a bigger reel, heavier line, heavier leaders, but you lose all of that sensitivity and you lose all of that sport. Nowadays, the logic is completely different because of the equipment that we have available nowadays, new generation PE lines that we have, which is the next generation of braid, thinner, rounder, smoother, okay? So we could scale everything down, make everything lighter, make everything more sensitive, and frankly, make fishing more fun. Because I can tell you when you have a deep drop rod on the side of your boat, pushing that button is fun, right? Having this under your arm and actually fighting the fish is a lot more fun. It really is, and a lot more sporty. And again, you can reel manually, or you can use the power assist feature. And you may be saying, well, that's not sporty at all, using a power assist reel. And I say to you, come out on my boat, Let's go out to 750 feet of water. I'll put that in your hand, the manual reel, with a 32 ounce sinker. I'm gonna grab this baby right here, and we're gonna drop down, okay? And we're gonna start at 9 a.m., and by 9.15, you're gonna be eating breakfast and having something to drink, because you're tired, and I'm gonna be fishing all day long, okay? So I'm not saying that, you know, electric reels and power assist reels should be used everywhere all of the time? Of course not. They're tools. They're specific tools that we use at a specific time for a specific reason. You know, it's like a, having a giant tool chest with certain tools. That's what power assist reels are. And the technology nowadays has gotten smaller, faster, and more powerful than ever before. I mean, again, look at the size of that thing. It's, it's like a micro electric reel. It really is but it's got enough power to pull up big fish and a lot of lead from deep water and plenty of line capacity on there as well. Little digital readout so you know exactly how many rotations, how much line is out. It even has a jigging feature where you can push a button and it will jig automatically for you. That's a little, uh, so that was it, right? You know, you don't need that when you're targeting the vermilions but it does have that feature as well. And again, at the end of the seminar, you can come up and check that out. I mean, feel how light that is. It's incredibly light, incredibly comfortable to fish. The rod's a little bit heavier, you know, able to handle more lead. Like I said, that 32 ounces because you are fishing that deeper water and sometimes you may even need more than that. But really these three outfits absolutely are my entire lineup of vermilion snapper fishing and yellow eye snapper fishing right there. Okay, I've got light, I've got medium, and I've got something a little bit on the heavier side if I'm fishing that deeper water. You don't need anything more than that. The rig is that high-low rig, as I mentioned. The two-hook rig, 
the VMC sure set circle hooks only difference okay only difference when I'm targeting the vermilions on the shallower side I fish the 2-0 hook when I'm targeting the yellow eye snapper which have a much larger mouth they have a much larger mouth a yellow eye snapper is much more like a mutton snapper okay and keep in mind there's a lot of people here who have probably never even caught a yellow eye snapper out here and didn't even know that they were out here Okay? And it took me years to find them, and I don't find them every time I go out. That's the thing about these things. Just when you think you got them figured out, they throw you for a loop. You know, they really do. You think you've got them dialed in, and man, I found these yellow eyes. They're on this one ledge out in 550 off Fort Lauderdale. I crushed them there last week. I go there again, I can't buy a bite. Can't buy a bite. You know why? Because they swim, they move, they don't sit in one spot. The school moves based on conditions. So you've got to put in that time. You've got to network, talk to other anglers, you know, talk to charter boat captain. Well, charter boat guys aren't telling you anything. Okay. Uh, call me, I'll tell you what I know. Okay. So again, that's really your flag. That's really the only difference is the size of the hook. The rig is the same. I am not fishing a deep drop rig, you know, a four or five hook deep drop rig. You don't need to do it in this scenario, okay? You don't, you wanna keep it sporty, you wanna keep it fun. You definitely have to fish a two hook rig at the bare minimum, why? Because you want one bait hugging the bottom because the groupers and the porgies hug the bottom. They won't come up off the bottom, so that bottom hook is where you're going to catch a lot of the bycatch, especially the porgies, which by the way, there's a variety of different species of porgies out here that inhabit our wrecks and the reefs and stuff like that. They're all very, very good eating fish. They get, they're a hard fighting fish, so you know, if you catch any porgies out here and they're over like 20 inches, they're all poisonous and call me and I'll dispose of them for you properly. Okay. The higher rig is where you're going to see primarily most of your snapper, the one that's elevated three or four feet off the bottom. So you're covering really two different strike zones with that high-low rig, okay, and a variety of different species. But additionally, if you miss a bite, anybody ever miss a bite on a fish? Okay, if you haven't, if you're not raising your hand, you've never been fishing. Okay, we've all missed fish, so you have a second chance. You really do, you've got a second chance. So I know if I miss a fish and I'm like, oh, I know he's on there and I slowly go to lift it up because remember we're fishing circle hooks. So what do we not want to do if we're fishing circle hooks? Jerk, we don't want to swing back like Bill Dance, okay, trying to drive a spinner bait into a two pound bass with 800 pounds of torque. That's not what we're doing, okay? You're fishing a circle hook, you get that bite, you feel like Morse code. That's what you feel is that fish is just tapping, tapping, tapping on that bait. Let him eat it, let him eat it, let him eat it, and slowly lift that rod. Just slowly lift the rod tip. You'll know if he's on there or not. That's all that you need to do with circle hooks. And if he is on there, just start winding. Okay, you know, you'll see even us sometimes we're fish a circle hook and, or a high low rig with circle hooks. We'll get a bite, okay, and, and suddenly I'll lift that rod up sharply. It's not that I'm trying to set the hook into the fish. I'm trying to get whatever slack line that I have between me and the rig. I'm trying to eliminate that slack as quickly as I can and get that line to be tight, okay? But remember, don't swing back like crazy. So with the circle hooks and the, I mean, I'm sorry, with the high-low rig, in the event that you miss a bite, you've got that second chance. That's what's really important. Next, I want to mention that on all of these areas where you're going to be targeting these vermilion snapper, where you're targeting the yellow eyes, and remember what I said, the vermilion snapper, I'm telling you this straight up. There's no secrets here, okay? Don't try and reinvent the wheel. 300 to 500 feet of water, wrecks and rock piles. Yellow eye snapper, 300 to 750 feet of water. You're not going to find any wrecks out here in 700, 600, 500 feet, some in 500, but they're really guarded secrets. There's not a lot of them, okay? But that deeper stuff is where you're going to find the yellow eye snapper. Focus on the deeper stuff. The further south you go, the more likely you are to achieve success, okay? If at the very least, if you don't get your hands on one of these Seymour systems, make sure that you, that you study local charts. We do have a reef locator right on our website, floridasportfishing.com. 
that has all of the GPS coordinates of every reef off every county. Great places to start. There are great places to start. If you don't have access to any other spots, start with the public spots because again, they, a lot of them do hold a lot of fish. Remember that it's all in the details, but getting back to it, you're fishing these areas, what else lives in these areas? What else may you catch in 300 to 700 feet of water? Pile fish you may catch, absolutely. Almaco jack, amber jack, you know, uh, what about top order species? Because I can tell you, if I was you, and if I was out there drifting in 300, 400, 500, would I be maybe jigging also? Maybe somebody on the boat drops down a vertical jig or a slow pitch jig, catching blackfin tunas in the same area, okay? Or how about take a couple of live baits and throw them out on spinning rods, one off the bow, one off the stern before you start fishing. So now I'm fishing the bottom, but I've got two baits. What am I gonna catch on those two baits? Dolphin. And how nice would it be for a 20 pound dolphin to eat one of your baits? Okay, I know I would love that. I do love that when that happens. Doesn't happen every time, but it'll never happen if you don't have those baits out. And what's nice about it is you don't have to go crazy about getting live bait, because guess what dolphin love to eat? Squid, especially that squid, the $25 a box squid. They really love that squid, okay? So make sure that, you know, in those you want to fish whole. You don't want to cut that up. Get a whole squid out there, drift it out away from the boat. Very simple, It'll take you, I'm telling you, 30 seconds to grab a spinning rod, flip a squid out, put in a rod holder. Get to the back of the boat, do the same thing, put it in a rod holder. Forget it, set them and forget about them until the rod just starts singing. You go up for another drift, obviously reel them up. You can even leave the squid on the hook. You don't have to take it off the hook. Don't let it bake out in the sun, especially that prime squid. But you know what I'm saying? Take care of that squid and then next drift, throw them back out there. And if you are persistent enough to do it, if you're, you know, if you force yourself and say, I'm going to do this every time, 50% of the time, you will catch dolphin. Not 50% of each drift. In other words, 50% of your trips, if you do that all day while you're fishing for snappers, you will catch dolphin half the time. Okay? And sometimes, hey, that could be a day saver, right? Maybe the bottom bites just isn't on, but suddenly a school of dolphin comes around the boat. And who doesn't like getting into a school of dolphin? If you don't like that, get out, okay, right now, because everybody loves catching dolphin, everybody. So maximize on every opportunity, you know, and be, you know, modify. When we fish, if there's, if I'm fishing, you know, just as an example with my brother and my nephews, we're doing different things. We're trying different things and we're getting dialed in. He hooks up on a jig, immediately I'm going to try and, you know, drop down a jig. Or vice versa, if we're getting crushed on bottom baits, then we'll all do that. But we like to mix it up. You know, that's, again, the one thing about fishing out here, there is only one guarantee, and that is there are no guarantees. You know, there are no guarantees. It changes every single day. Fortunately, with the vermilion snappers and the yellow eye snappers, you don't need any lures. You don't need any super fancy schmancy gear. You need a high-low rig. Okay? You need to buy yourself a spool of line, some diamond presentation fluorocarbon. You need to buy yourself a pack of hooks, some sure set VMC circle hooks, tie yourself some high-low rigs, get some bank sinkers anywhere from 8 to 24 ounces, depending on the depth, depending on the speed of the current. Make sure you take a variety of lead out there. Be prepared to lose a couple rigs every now and then. Make sure you have plenty of bait. This is all cut and dry, simple stuff, but the details make the difference. Make sure you check every single connection. You know, remember what I said earlier, angler failure. Anybody ever lose a fish from something stupid that they did? Okay. Anybody ever lose a fish because they didn't have their drag set properly? Anybody ever lose a fish, maybe a big dolphin, because they hit it in the head with the gaff instead of sticking the gaff in the fish? Okay. Or anybody ever lose a fish because they tried to lift the big fish out of the water with the rod and the leader busted? Anybody ever lose a fish because of a bad knot? Come on, don't be babies. Never. Yeah. We all have. Okay. So it's if we eliminate 
these little details, if we eliminate angler failure and if we eliminate tackle failure from the equation, we're all going to be much more successful anglers. We really, really are. And fortunately for the vermilion snappers and the yellow eyes, it's simple, but it's all about the details. But it's a great way to spend half a day with family, friends, novices who maybe aren't that familiar with fishing. You know, you get some guests on your boat who have never been out there fishing and you go out there trolling for dolphin for four hours straight and never get a bite. Did that ever happen to anybody? Okay, they get really bored really quick and they're looking at you going, you have a fishing show? Really? Okay, however, you put them on a wreck with a high-low rig and you say, drop that to the bottom and just hold on. Just don't do anything. Just drop it to the bottom. And as soon as they get to the bottom, you want to see somebody light up when that rod starts going. Tut, 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 tut. You know, it doesn't take much to make people happy, you know, and it's a great eating fish. We just, we cooked some up on a recent recipe you can find on our social network where we fried a Caribbean whole snapper with some peppers and spices. Really, really great stuff. Really simple, really fresh.